Welcome traders to today's online educational series, next installment with me, Patrick Munley. Um, can I just quickly do an audio check, uh, make sure you guys can hear me. Could you type a Y in the chat box if you can? Um, also, you should be able to see a, um, a welcome screen. Great stuff. Okay, so let's uh, let's first of all, as always, um, just review the risk disclaimer, and uh, I'll take a second to appreciate that uh, obviously foreign exchange trading or any trading really is uh, is a risky endeavour. But certainly, you are doing um, doing yourself a service in terms of mitigating that risk by participating in these uh, in these educational sessions and equipping yourself with extra levels of knowledge before you uh, undertake any trading activities. So before we jump into today's content, um, hopefully by now most of you know who I am, but for those who don't, um, for those of you who are here for the first time, I'll just give you a, a brief overview of my background. Um, after I graduated from King's College in London, um, I went on to join a, uh, a city consulting firm and um, after a period at the firm, I left with a group of guys from the firm to, to do a startup. Um, the startup experienced a, uh, a significant period of growth, and, uh, and after four or five years, I cashed in my, my stake, and, um, and I began to pursue my, my passion for, um, for markets. Uh, as is often the case with, uh, with new traders or, or people who are making their first steps into the market, what I refer to as, as more meddling in the market than trading as such. Um, I, I had a, a pretty good run in terms of beginner's luck. And, um, and I started to make some quite significant gains. However, as is often the case, that, um, that beginner's luck ran out and, um, and I gave those gains back and then some. Um, after taking a, a significant loss, I uh, took a period to reflect upon what I was doing and. And really as to whether or not I wanted to make a, a serious commitment to trading and to, to treat it like a business. And um, I took that decision. I sought out a, a mentor, someone who had uh, demonstrated excellence in the, in the field of trading. And um, I underwent a period of educating um, myself through, uh, through his mentorship, not only in the, the technical aspects of trading, but more importantly, really, um, in the mental aspects and we focused a huge amount upon, upon my mental game and really was a period um, during which I became far more self-aware and um, I really began to become a student of risk. So during this time I developed a trade plan, I back tested it, I forward tested it and I then um, underpinned that with a rigorous risk management strategy. And that, that plan and, uh, and strategy, I took to the market in 2008. And since then, on an annual basis, I've, uh, I've delivered profitable returns. Um, and I say annual basis because really that's how I assess my performance. I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not interested in the outcome of, of individual trades or really um, even in a set of trades as such. It's really that, um, to, to my mind, what I'm doing in terms of executing my plan is I'm collecting data, and that data should, over an extended series of outcomes, so weeks, months, years, should demonstrate the edge of my strategy. And, uh, and like I say, fortunately for me, it has done since 2008. Uh, since 2010, I've also um, mentored hundreds of private traders, um, from complete novices through to uh, former uh, Chicago pit traders who have made the move to the screens in really developing trading plans, execution strategies, and, and mental performance. Um, since 2013, I have uh, I've actually been responsible for managing investor capital through a managed account service that I run. Uh, and again, that, that strategy since 2013 has also delivered profitable annual returns. Um, most recently, I, uh, I was approached by Tickmill to become a resident market expert. I deliver um, research and analysis to them 
and you can access that through uh, the Tipnor blog page. I believe you can now get email alerts um, as to when new posts are, are put on there. Um, and I also, uh, most recently, have, uh, have been hired by a, uh, an online trading education firm to head up their trading and trader education program. Um, the, the unique aspect of that firm is that not only we do, do we provide trader education, but we also then fund retail trading talent uh, through a funded account service that we, um, that we also run. That firm is called uh, fxcareerswap.com if you want to take a look. Um, and that really brings you up to speed with, uh, with who I am and, and where I'm coming from. Um, now let's move into uh, to taking, in, taking a, a quick look back at, um, at what we've been talking about over, over the previous weeks, really, and then a, a, an idea of what we're going to be talking about with, over the, the next phase. This is what we refer to as the intermediary phase in terms of the, the education process that we've been running now. For, um, for about eight or nine weeks. Today we're going to, we're going to delve into market cycles um, and, and really the idea of time as well as price. In, in the past few sessions, we've been focused on how we can use um, simple strategies to help us identify very quickly when we open a chart what type of market phase we're in. Are we in a trend or are we correcting? And if so, how those, those different phases can offer trading opportunities using some very simple tools. And for the purposes of what we've been doing, it's been Fibonacci retracements, extensions, and projections. Um, once we complete today's session in terms of looking at, at market cycles, we, uh, in next week's session, are going to move on to actually looking at specific trading strategies that I use. Uh, so over the coming four weeks, we're going to look at four of the, the key approaches that I use to identify uh, trading opportunities. And you'll see how the educational aspects of what we've been looking at over these prior four weeks, uh, the first four weeks were just basic uh, introductory information to, to the markets. These prior four weeks, we've been looking more at how we can actually uh, consistently analyze and, and identify um, and frame the market data in front of us in terms of the charts. Like I say, in coming four weeks, we're going to, to move into looking at how, uh, how we can actually um, execute trading strategies that have proven themselves consistently profitable over, over many, many years. So that's, uh, that's just to give you a heads up in terms of the structure and, and where we're moving to. Now let's take it back to, to today's session and, um, and what it is we're going to be looking at. So traditional cycles, um, or, or are based upon time between highs and lows. Okay, that's how um, markets, have, uh, that's how people who look at the markets tend to frame the, the reference of a cycle. So an average cycle length is, is actually not particularly useful information because it doesn't because it doesn't really consider how tight or widespread the range of the numbers are um, that are used to make up that, that average cycle length. If most of the cycle repetitions that were used to come up with the average cycle were tightly grouped or um, gave a confluent area, that average would actually be far more useful in terms of information. Unfortunately, an average can be made of any series of numbers which may be widely dispersed. The average may be meaningless really in predicting the next repetition point. So traditional market cycle analysis also assumes a cycle length is static and the static cycle will continue indefinitely into the future. It just doesn't work that way. Price and volatility cycles change over time. What might have been a fairly regular cycle in the past may no longer be evident in recent market activity because cycles in and of themselves are not static, they're actually dynamic. So the typical low to low or high to high cycle lengths are generally different for bull and bear markets and will fluctuate over time as volatility and price cycles fluctuate. Additionally, markets generally make their highs and lows at dynamic proportions of past trends and counter trends. 
Just as we discovered in the previous sessions that most trend and corrective highs and lows are made at or very near proportions of recent sections of the trend of correction. A similar approach can be taken to, to time proportion. So what we're going to do today is we're going to use some tools that will help identify time targets for reversals. So you'll learn a logical, practical approach to time target analysis. Time retracements are made up in the same way as price retracements, except time units are used instead of price units. As we know, most corrections are made at or near one of the key Fibonacci retracements. Why shouldn't they also be made at or near a key time retracement? That's the question that I've asked myself, and after studying um, GAN, WD GAN, a famous market analyst, price and time strategies, GAN price and time analysis often seems very complicated, but for the most part, it really boils down to a simple concept. Most highs and lows are made in proportion to one or more previous sections of the trend or counter trend. To learn how to make price so to learn how to make price retracement zones, time retracements are made just in the same process as the price retracements, but on the time axis. And they use some of the same ratios that we use for the price retracements. So the ratios for time retracements are the 38.2%, 50%, 61.8%, 100%, and 161.8%. In most cases, we just use the 38.2, uh, 61.8, and 100% proportions to help identify time targets for corrections. The ratios are often expressed as percentages, just, just like the price retracements. It will, probably, it will probably not be complete, a time retracement, in, in terms of when it tests the 38.2% retracement, as we talked about last week in terms of the price when price retraced to the 38.2% retracement normally that suggests price is going to pause and then we're going to correct and actually make another leg higher in terms of the correction but it will probably in terms of time be complete more often than not between the 61.8 and the 100% structures if a market is correcting into a price target and a momentum reversal, remember we use the stock, stochastic RSI to help us identify momentum. Then we can actually combine these tools. So we have price retracement, time retracement, and our stochastic um, momentum indicator to help identify when a, when a correction or a trend is likely to have completed. So what I'm gonna do now is we've used this, um, this example, we've been looking at it over the past few sessions of the Euro, um, this is a, a setup that I identified in the daily market outlook that I posted on the 7th of January. At the point I posted it, we, um, we didn't have all this data. We just um, we completed this move to the downside and we'd, uh, we had this corrective type price action. And I suggested at this point that we would make another leg higher before seeing the next leg down. Now. Let's just remember some of the key concepts that we, we think about in terms of identifying trend or non-trending action. The trend in terms of swings in the price should not be overlapping, okay? So once we, once we made this correction and we exceeded the prior low, we then had another trend move to the downside. Again, we identify the trend move as non-overlapping sections of of price which we've got here so once we have our trend in place we then using our um, retracement tools had a couple of levels that we wanted to focus on we traded up into the 38.2 percent retracement and as we often do that level caused a pause in the price action wasn't the wasn't um, sufficient really as a minimum requirement for the for the corrective cycle to have completed but we then made another swing high let's bring it back in our momentum tool here so we have this swing and then we look for a swing low we've got this swing low here and then once we've taken out this high we had um, an a b c d pattern that we talked about so we had this um, price projection versus the um, versus the last corrective move so this is the tool we use the fibonacci 
um, trend-based projection, and that gave us a price level of 111.65 that we wanted to uh, we wanted to see a test of in terms of a minimum target for um, from a time perspective. Uh, sorry, for a price perspective. Now, in today today, what we're going to do is we're also now going to bring. We'll just we'll get rid of the big retracement, the, the price projection for now. We'll also get rid of the uh, extension there from price and now we're just going to focus on time what you'll see here this tool is uh let me go to the settings this is the fib time zone tool on the trading view platform that you can all access and these are the settings i use again what i won't do is i'm not going to spend a, a huge amount of time really going over the settings you, there will be a, a link for the video shared and you can um, you can review these in your own time but these are the settings we're, we're focused on in terms of the fib based time retracements we've got the uh, zero to one it basically identifies the swing so that gives us the the original time structure and we then have the 38.2 61.8 and and the 100 percent now on here it says 1.382 1.618 and two the reason it says that is that we have um zero to one being our original measurement so these are the extensions. So the 1.382 represents 38.2% of this time period. Okay, is, is that making sense? Can you type a Y in the chat box if you're following along with respect to that concept? But the 1.382 on this on our settings represents the 30 38.2% of the time it took for this swing to occur. Okay. Why in the chat box would be useful to let me know that uh, that this is this is sinking in, guys. Good stuff. Okay, so we have um, we have the thirty-eight point. We'll just get rid of that for a second. Um, we have the thirty-eight point two percent of this time. We then have the sixty-one point eight percent, and then we have the two hundred percent. Now, a couple of things I want you to bear in mind. As I said from the outset. More often than not, the 38.2% time retracement, when we test that level, although it's the minimum requirement for a completion in terms of a time cycle, we would only really pay attention to that level if, it, if when we trade that 38.2% level, we've actually um, seen an equidistant swing, so an ABCD pattern, or we've traded the 50% price retracement of the swing, okay? But more often than not, the 61.8% of, of this swing in terms of time projected here with our FIB time zone tool will be where we see um, the, the patterns complete in terms of corrections. The maximum we want to, to look at is a 100%. Is a so this, this swing here, if I draw this in, so this swing here, by the time we trade, by the time in, by, uh, sorry, by the time time trades to this level, this has actually been an equal, equal measure in terms of time, okay? So by the time we've made that equal test of the, the 200, which is the 100% equivalent in terms of time of the original swing, more often than not, that should represent the completion of a complex correction. And let's just draw back in for complex corrections for those who um, want a quick refresh on that. More often than not, uh, using the Elliott Wave tool here, corrections occur in three waves. Yeah, so that would be a correction. But they can also occur, they can also extend to make <laughs> what we call a complex correction, which looks like this. Okay, so it's two sets of threes. Yeah. Now, the minimum requirement for an ABC correction <clears throat> is the 38.2% time retracement. So in this instance, we have our swing high, we have a swing low. Yeah, as as again. For, for, the, for, um, for objectivity in terms of taking away the guesswork out of the swings when you're first starting out, you can use just reference the stochastic swing points to give you an objective measurement of 
um, of the structure. So what we've got here is an ABC, so a, a simple correction, completing at the 38.2% retracement. So what we've got there are the minimum requirements to suggest from a time perspective that a correction could have completed. Now, we want again, we want to factor in the concept that the 38.2% retracement is more often than not a pause than the actual reversal. So we get the put, we get a pullback, we make a new low in our momentum indicator, but know that we don't break the prior swing low. So we can't at this point accurately suggest that the completion is complete. Okay, so once we have this low in place and we take out the prior swing low, then more often than not, we, 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 we understand that we could be going into a complex correction. And in this instance, that's what plays out because we have our swing points. Just draw these in quickly. And then we make the complex correction. So we have an A, B, C, D, E pattern. And note that the A, B, C, D, E pattern completes at the 100% time projection. So key takeaways from this section are a, a simple A, B, C, a simple A, B, C corrected pattern at a minimum should complete at the 38.2% retracement. More often than not, they will complete at the 61.8% time retracement, okay? If we haven't completed the correction by then, the only other correction we can consider or we want to pay attention to is the complex correction, which should complete at the 100% time projection, okay? Now in a minute we're going to put, we're going to add in the price retracements, but for now we just want to focus on these time levels so that we get familiar with them before adding in, adding back in the price. So now that we've so now we've got our, our fib retracement levels, what we can also now look at are our are our fib um, expansion levels. So as we same as we use the trend-based fib extension to measure in price our A B C D our A, A B C patterns. Is anyone else having an issue with the sound? No, uh, one second guys. Uh, Gordon, you'll have to log out and log back in. Okay, let's uh, let's carry on. Gordon will have to uh, can hear. Okay, right. Let's get rid of some of those. Okay, so we have our. It's just the same as we have our um, our, our our price levels in terms of the A B C pattern or A B C D, depending on which one you want to use. We also have the ability to do that for pri uh, for time. And for that, we use the trend-based FIB time tool, okay? So what we do there is we measure our swing points again, and this time we get a projection in terms of time, okay? So once we have our swing levels in place, our A, our B, swing high, we measure a time projection for our B points, okay? Let me just get rid of those. So now what we get is a time-based um, extension, which gives us a window for where the where this um, where this from a time perspective where we're likely to see the correction complete. And what we notice, similar to the um, the principle that we use in terms of price, we get a cluster. We want to pay attention to the fib clusters. Okay. So here, in terms of the cluster. We actually get a confirmation, not only in terms of the, 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 the um, time-based retracement, but now we have a time-based extension suggesting that from a time perspective, this, this, um, this correction should complete in and around 
uh, one o'clock in the morning on the 14th of January. Okay, so we can be that precise here with these time uh, time tools. Now, we also then have our momentum tool indicating that this that the correction is is in uh, is overbought. Okay, from the uh, from the uh, RSI stochastic, and we've got two time confluent factors. Okay, now if we bring back in our fib based retracement, so now we're looking at price. And we start to see where that sinks up. Well, we've got a 50%. So we achieve the minimum price requirement for the correction to complete. Okay. And we can also bring in our time, uh, sorry, our, um, our tool for measuring the trend extension. So we have A, B, C. And a couple of things are interesting now, aren't they? Because what we've got here, oh, actually, we'll go back one, two. What we've got here is that we don't actually make the minimum, more often than not, the minimum requirement. Again, remember how we want to, to phrase our, our approach to the markets is that we're always thinking in terms of more often than not in probabilities, not in absolutes. We don't actually test into the equidistant swing from a price perspective. Now, more often than not, as a minimum requirement, that's what we'll achieve, the A, B, you know, the equality swing, the A, B, C. So we don't get that, but we have confluent time factors and we do achieve the 50% retracement. So from a probabilities perspective, in terms of building the case for a trade, the minimum requirements have been met. We meet it from both the time and price perspective and we do sell off. Okay, but when, we know that when we get that next swing low using our, um, our momentum tool, that we see we haven't taken out the prior swing and we haven't got a new low in price. So immediately what we can think to ourselves is that there's a high probability that the correction is not complete and we have some new levels to measure from. Okay, so now we have this A, B, C, and we can change our time tools to reflect change in time. And then we watch to see where we get confluence. And what do we get? Well, we now have a 61.8% retracement from a price perspective. We have an A, B, C, D from a price perspective, coalescing in and around this 111.65 to 111.59. So that's giving us a, a six pip window from a price perspective. And now what we want to see is where we are from a time perspective. Are there any cluster points that are available to us? And what do we get? Well, we have the, the two uh, we have the 200 percent level which we know is where a complex correction that's the maximum time perspective for a complex correction to com complete if we exceed if price exceeds this level in terms of time then more often than not we're actually seeing a new trends occur so again we, we can't you know not every correction is going to fit this model but more often than not it will and that's what we want to focus on as traders, probabilities, not certainty. We're just dealing with probabilities here. So we've got, a, we've got a time and we've got a price cluster. OK, so what we do on our charts at this stage will be we just mark that area as being a high probability time and price window for the correction to complete. OK. And we see price trade up into there and price, although we break through in terms of spiking, on the closing basis, we don't close above that level and we sell off and we make new lows. OK. So is everyone following along there in terms of how we overlay these time structures with the price structures to give us even better confluence? Let's look at another example. Because what do we So Let's get rid of all these tools. We'll start from afresh. So once we take out this prior swing low, we then want to look at the, the structure of, the prior, of that prior price action to identify as best as possible as to whether or not we've seen another trend move. And so in this instance, bring, we can just bring in the alert wave tools for simplicity here. We can clearly see a structure that suggests a five, a, a five wave move has occurred non-overlapping price action. Remember the basic concepts of what we want to use here. We don't want to get caught up in analyzing every 
uh, every move on the chart and, and drawing as many lines as possible and really just getting paralyzed by our own analysis, so to speak. We want to keep things as simple as possible. So we, we know we've had a five wave structure, we've taken out the prior swing lows, we know that the last move was a correction. So more often than not, we're now, we can confidently say that we're in a, we're in a new trend move. So let's see where we are from a time perspective though, to see if we can identify in time where we might see the next correction complete. So we bring in our time zone tool, and we've got ourselves a window there now. We can get rid of those settings. So we, now we've got a window, a minimum level from time. So at this point, it's January the 20th. And we know by the 21st would be the minimum, uh, 10, 10, 10 a.m. on the 21st would be the minimum time scale that we could expect, reasonably expect, the correction to complete. And once we see our swing in place, our swing low, we have a swing high, we get a pullback using just the simple tools, the, the, the momentum stochastic here, stochastic RSI. So now we can start to think to ourselves, right, we've actually got a swing level in place that we can um, measure from. So let's do another time-based measurement now. For this one, we're going to use our trend-based FID time tool. And here we have our low, our high, and our low. So now we've got a window here from a time perspective between the 20th, so let's draw in time zone here. So we've got on the 21st from 10 to 3, from 10 a.m. to 3 o'clock in, in the afternoon is a time window we, when we could reasonably expect this correction to complete. At this point, obviously, we don't see this data. We're projecting into the into the future, um, but we can we get once we've got these two swing points in place, as as just using our stochastic RSI, then we're able to, with a level of objectivity, identify this time slot. Now, let's see in terms of bringing in some price measurements what we do as we trade into that area. So, 38.2% is we know that prices will pause there, but we exceed that 38.2, and we trade just shy of the 50% level, okay? But we also have another tool to help us, which is our trend-based FIB tool, which gives us an A, a B, and a C. So now we have an A, B, C, we have a minimum time requirement, and we're trading into a price retracement zone, okay? And we're able to identify that, that zone there even if we go up to the 50 so that gives us 111.20 from 111.10 so a 14 pip window and a four hour time window when we can confidently expect that this correction completes and we do complete ultimately and we take out the prior swing lows okay and what happens next? Well, trend continues. So now we'll do one more here. We'll remove all these drawings and I'll just bring it all back in for you. So the price extends lower and we are watching for the correction. So we now have this swing high down to this swing low, okay? And we bring in our time tool, so we have this, uh, sorry, that first of all, we'll take a look at, uh, we'll bring in our price tool here, and then we'll overlay the FIB retracement in terms of price. What we won't do is here, we won't scroll forward. So let's do all this from these two swing points and see how, uh, see how this works for us. Um, now we want to do a FIB time zone retracement, this swing high to this swing low. Okay, so now we've got two levels on our charts already. So we can scroll forward a few bars here. We can start to see, what we want to see now is the swing low in terms of our momentum tool to potentially give us a level to identify the first leg of this correction. We've got some price levels that we're watching and in a minute we'll see some time levels. So now we have a swing low. So this could be our A, B, C. So once we take out this high, which we do, we now can bring in our um, trend-based FIB extension. So now we have an A, 
a B and a C. So we've got some tight, so we've got some price levels now we can start to look at. So this 11064 is one we can, is one area we can look at. But we have the 1618 extension up here at 109.36, and we have the 111 there as some additional resistance. So let's track forward here a few candles. Now, take out the equidistant swing level, but we knew that there was a high probability that, that wouldn't be the completion of the correction because 38.2% of tracements more often than not are the pause as opposed to the correction. And let's just now start to look and bring in the time from our A and our B points. So we knew that when we got up to this equidistant swing, we didn't have any time confluence. So let's start to see where we get some time confluence. Well, this is the first area. First time zone was on the 3rd of February, uh, 3rd of February where we also had the 1618 extension of our ABC. And just above there, we had the 61.87 retracement. And we had, um, and we had a price rejection from that point. Okay. Now, do we, do, does it, does price, so at this level, we've satisfied some of the minimum requirements in both price and time. Now let's track forward and see what happens. And we actually break down through the lows. Okay. So once we break the lows, then we've got another section of um, price and time that we can start to look at. So let's go through and see once we make the low here we'll bring in the tool again and we'll do one more of these measurements okay let's remove all the drawings so this this leg um completed the minimum and so now what we've got is a potential swing low in place let's see do we you know we break lower let's follow this into to getting the swing low and then we'll We'll do the measurement. Uh, this is the current, <laughs> sorry. Unfortunately, that's the actual current move we're in. So actually, this is interesting in terms of mapping going forward, guys, for you guys. Let's take a look now and just overlay. This is real time. This is first the current um, price levels. Let's bring in our tools and start to track some levels and we can revisit this um, in next week's session. So we have, the first, if this is our low or wherever we make our low, but for now we'll use this as our low. So we have some price levels and let's bring in our time levels and we'll identify at this point, we can only do the retracements because we haven't got our AB level, but let's look just from a time perspective where we could anticipate if we hold these current lows, we could be looking at the 18th of February, minimum 50% retracement more often than not, but certainly 38.2. So between 109.50 and 109.80, at a minimum on the 13th of February, but more, more often than not into 20th, uh, sorry, the 18th of February or the 20th of February. Now, let me just draw in for um, the purposes of tracking this, the types of corrections we can see. So if we have this being our A, so we trade into the 38.2 and we pause a B and a C point, We'll bring us up into this area yeah and once we've got that once we've got the a and the b we can also then bring in again okay, just so that you can start to do that follow this at home um the fib trend based fib times so once you've got that a b you then get a c window so we can start to see how the time is clustering here around this 18th of February. Obviously, we're tracking this into the future. I'll, um, I'll, what I'll do is when this, when this um, pattern plays out, I'll actually do a post on the daily market outlook for you guys to follow along as I track this. Um, so one, where we, where, once we've got that swing low, then we can do time and price calculations that at this point gives a cluster in and around the 18th of February. And we've got a 30 pip window in terms of price. Uh, this, you know, in terms of tracking this forward into if we make, if this is our low, if we make a new low, then we repeat this process into the new low. Does that make sense, guys? So, what I'll do is um, I'll update that uh, with a post on the, on the blog. Uh, the Ticknell blog, and we'll actually track the development of this in real time so that you'll get a real time example over the next week of how we can use the retracement tools 
both time and price and how we can use the expansion tools in but we're using both time and price okay so that wraps up um the the, the content for today in terms of looking at at cycles does anyone have any questions at this point Yeah, the, the, I mean it can, uh, Aruna. That's that's a it, 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 the, the, depending upon the instrument you're trading. If you're trading some of you know some of these majors, because we're in a, a fairly low volatility environment at the moment, then the setups can take a bit longer to develop. But really, that that's where um, you know the patience aspect of trading comes in. I mean, you you know you can go a long time in terms of trading using a, a process or a plan and not get any signals but that's part of the patience and discipline of being a professional trader but i mean you know you've got 28 forex pairs that you can trade um, you've got cfd you've got cfds you've got um, indexes you've got commodities so there are there's a there's a broad array of of instruments and if you you know if you're going to use this work and track that across all those instruments i'm certain that uh, trade frequency should, wouldn't be an issue Any other questions, guys? Okay, if there are, uh, okay, I currently trade FX. Yeah, do Aruna, you know, gold, silver, oil um, are all great trading instruments, the S&P 500. I encourage you to take a look at, they, you know, the, this strategy in terms of Fibonacci time and price retracements and extensions works on all instruments and, and on all time frames. Okay, if there aren't any other questions, I'm going to wrap this up here. And like I say, I'll update you in real time regarding this, uh, this euro dollar chart as we, we go through the week. And next week, we will start looking at specific trading strategies that, uh, that I use in the markets. Okay, thanks very much for your time, everyone. I hope this content was useful.